This morning we're reading the letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of His name, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Word of God for the people of God. God. Well, here we are at the end of this season of preparation, these four Sundays before Christmas, the season of Advent. We've been talking about the coming of this Christ child. We've been waiting and watching, expecting God's love to be born alive in our lives. Some even struggling to believe that that might be true, that God would work in their lives in such a way. But all that we've been reading, all we've been talking about, pointing to this special night when this child is going to be born. And you might think we would read one of those stories, even as we did in the gospel reading that Paula shared with us earlier. But since I'm working out the epistles or the letters of the New Testament or the Christian scriptures, we're in Romans this year. And in Romans, it mentions this lineage that this Christ child's coming from, the lineage of King David. But Paul's version of things pivots around the resurrection. He doesn't talk so much about the birth, but he wants to make sure you know about the resurrection in verse 4 he says of Jesus that he was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead Paul wants you to know what God has done and what God is doing in the world it can seem kind of backwards since we start at the birth and kind of work our way through the life of Christ as we go through the Christian year But Paul, Paul has been changed by the resurrection, by the risen Christ. As far as we know, Paul's writing these letters before any of the Gospels have been written. As far as we know, he doesn't have any information about the circumstances of the birth of Jesus. Oh, he says he has the prophets of the Holy Scriptures talking about the Hebrew Scriptures that are inspired. They're predicting that God is going to do this thing. And Paul is saying, it's happened. God has raised this Jesus from the dead. All these disciples who had been following Him, seeing Him arrested and crucified, buried, they think all hope is gone. And then three days later, Christ is raised from the dead. Now, at that moment, Paul is still not a part of this movement. In fact, he is persecuting those who are proclaiming this. But then he has his own personal experience with the risen Christ, and everything in his life at that point changes forever. He says God came to him, that this voice of the risen Christ spoke to him, and he realized that God was at work in the world in a whole different way than he understood And the Christian movement is born from the time of this resurrection on. So Paul is writing these letters before the Gospels have recorded these birth stories. But as so often happens when somebody does something great or something to take note of or something remarkable or unique, then others begin to look back into their formative years to try to figure out why this person? Why are they special? How did they come to this moment? Where are they from? Where were they born? Others begin to 
look back to try to make sense of what has happened that happens in the gospel process as well but we see that in everyday life where people begin to look back when somebody seems to be exhibiting greatness if you're not a college football fan you may not know but the heisman trophy was awarded just a few weeks ago earlier this month it's the award given to the player that all these voters across the country believe has performed the best this year in college football Even if you're not a college football fan, you should know the last two winners, last year's and this year, both played right here in the state of Oklahoma for the Oklahoma Sooners. We've won two in a row, if you will. But you know, when I was growing up, when I was just a kid, the Heisman announcement was like a moment, a couple of minutes maybe. But now it's an hour-long television special. Somebody realized, you know what, lots of people will tune in to hear the player interviewed, to see their parents talk about how they raised them, maybe to see footage of where they grew up or what they looked like as a player when they were a kid. For a whole hour, those who've been nominated for this award are gathered together, their friends, their family, their coaches, all invited, and it's a national, worldwide television broadcast. It's fun when somebody from this area wins, so it's been really fun these last couple of years. But it's not just when a local guy wins that people are interested. Humans are curious about greatness. And so we tend to begin to look back to the childhood or the formative years or even the birth circumstances to try to provide context and explanation of why this person ended up in this place at this time well as the gospels begin to be put together and we believe they were written after these letters of paul all of them center around the last week of jesus life if you read through any one of the four gospels the longest portion deals with the last week of the life of christ the crucifixion and the resurrection if you will And Mark, that we believe was the first written, doesn't have anything about the birth of Jesus. John, which was written last, we believe, doesn't have anything about the birth of Jesus. But Matthew and Luke, they both tell us a story about what happened, what kind of circumstances surrounded the birth of this Jesus of Nazareth. So we have those stories to read during these times of year when we're celebrating God's love being born into the world. But when Paul's writing, he doesn't have a copy of Matthew or a copy of Luke. They had not all been edited and composed yet. But Paul knows about the resurrection, and he wants us to know about the resurrection because he tells us that it's important because of what it brings us. In verse 5 and 6, he says, through this Jesus being raised from the dead, we have received grace and apostleship to bring faith among all the Gentiles, or you could say all the peoples of the world. And then he makes sure that you know you're included. He says, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. That's the language he uses, that you are called to belong to to Jesus Christ. Just as the gospel birth stories declare that this birth is good news to all the people, Paul says a similar kind of thing. Even though Paul is a Jew and Jesus is a Jew, Paul's saying this God that we have known through Judaism has done something even bigger than the Jews. He's gone beyond Judaism to make this revelation for all people in the world that all might come to know of the great mercy, love, and grace that is offered to us from God. And he says, make sure you include yourselves. Make sure you know you are included in this invitation to receive and live in God's love. In fact, he says you're called to belong, but then he also says you are sent. He uses the word apostle Apostle means to be sent. 
So Paul is saying, you're invited, you're welcomed, include yourself in the love of God. But once you recognize and experience it, realize that you're also sent out to share the love you have known through Christ with any and all that you might encounter. Paul says the message, the good news, is about power, grace, and peace. You can hear him summarize that in the last part of verse 7, that last verse we read. He writes, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is such an important word in Christian thought, belief, in Christian theology. It's this gift of God. As we say in the baptismal formula, when we're beginning the baptismal service, we say that this gift of baptism or this gift of grace or this gift of God's love is given to us without price. It's the unmerited love of God. In other words, it doesn't matter what you've done. You can't do anything to earn it or deserve it. God offers it to us freely because we are part of God's family. But then Paul also says this grace, this love of God that we are offered from God leads us to peace. Now, peace in the Bible when it's used as a biblical word, means more than just serenity or calmness. Oh, it means that. But it means more than that in the Bible. It's a word that that means that God is offering us everything we need for wholeness or fullness of life. That God is offering us all the love and joy that a human life can contain. That God wants all of us to experience that abundant life. That comes when we recognize that God is at work in our lives for good and loving us through any and every circumstance we might experience. Before we close, I want to revisit this mental image I've given you for Advent where I've been suggesting that these writings from Paul give us a recipe. So many of us are baking cookies and other treats this time of year. Earlier in the week, our staff here had a little uh, cookie exchange where many of us spent some time baking our favorite Christmas cookies and then we displayed all those and shared them around. Most of us followed a recipe when we were cooking those cookies, I've suggested to you that Paul is giving us a recipe that we can follow to experience and share the love of God. The first thing I suggested Paul said to us is that we should start with light. That is, we should focus on the light and the love, the salvation that God has offered us. And then the next week, we were reading from Paul again, and he said, add encouragement. And he says the way we can do this is for ourselves to be open to the encouragement of God. That this is not a do-it-yourself project, but this is a project that's God-inspired. That through the Holy Scriptures and through Christian fellowship, God nurtures us, fuels us, nourishes us in the faith. And then we are ready to share encouragement with others. So I said the second step of the recipe was add encouragement. Then last week... The step was include welcome. Paul reminded us that we were welcomed by Christ. And since we were welcomed by Christ, we should welcome others. We should welcome one another. So that was the third step in the recipe. And then today, Paul says to us, mix with grace and peace. Mix with grace and peace from God. Paul's experience is that to follow this recipe, is to be changed and shaped by God. Paul writes about that over and over in his letters, about how God has changed him. That even though he's the chief among sinners, that God is shaping him and filling him with his love that he might share it with others. Paul's making the same point, I think, As the gospel writers, when they write their birth stories, they're saying whether it's in the birth or the death or resurrection, either story, you can encounter this God who is alive and at work in your life. 
And that this God wants to fill you with all goodness and kindness, all wholeness, all love and all joy that a human life can ever hope to experience. A few weeks ago, if you were here, you might remember, I told you I was reading a book by a young woman who's a professor at the Duke Divinity School. Her name is Kate Bowler. She writes about her life being raised as a Christian and then marrying her high school sweetheart and how they had difficult, difficulty conceiving and then finally, after going through all these different processes, had a baby. And then she got this job at Duke and everything was wonderful. And then all of it gets interrupted when she begins to have some physical problems. And finally, she's diagnosed with stage four cancer and the outlook is not bright they tell her that she may only have months to live she can hardly believe it i mean everything was going just right and now this disease threatens to steal it all away and end it all prematurely She's written a book about this with a provocative title, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. As she deals with this whole experience of having this cancer and possibly dying, she becomes more and more depressed until finally one doctor says, well, you know, they're getting ready to do this new drug trial for your kind of cancer. You could apply for that. That might be your best hope of beating this. So she applies and waits and waits. And then finally, she finds out that sure enough, she's accepted into the trial Her hopes began to rise again, and all of a sudden she says she had this urge to write, and she began to write furiously about sitting in the waiting room, going to see the doctor, what the other patients were like, what she was feeling. And before long, she felt like she had a piece worth reading, and she sent it to the New York Times. And sure enough, they decided to publish it and actually feature it in the Sunday paper. She said, I was surprised that they chose it and featured it like that, but I was even more surprised when I began to get one letter, then two. And she said before long, she had received thousands and thousands of letters from other people who had read the story. And they were writing, asking her questions or giving her advice, asking for prayers and offering prayers to her. She said some of them unfortunately wrote to shame her that she didn't have enough faith because if she did, God would have already healed her. But she said the letters that spoke to her most, that meant the most to her, were people who weren't trying to give her advice or trying to figure out why some die and some don't when they have the same disease. But those who wrote to talk about or to ask, who was there when you thought the end was so close? Were you alone? She said one man told her about his own experience. Where one night some armed gunmen broke into his home, took his family hostage, threatened to kill him and rape his wife and daughter. He said it was terrible. Yet despite the terror, he writes that he knew that God was with them. Kate Bowler writes this after she read his letter. She said he can't explain who loosened the ropes and let him escape with his family unharmed. And he will never understand why he survived when his neighbor was found outside hanging by a rope the next morning. He doesn't rationalize why some people are rescued and others are hanged. But she says he knows God was there because he felt peace, indescribable peace, and it changed him forever. Forever. 
She says he ended his letter with a shrug, if you will. He wrote this. I have no idea how this works, but I wish this for you, this indescribable peace. I wish this for you as you move forward on this journey. May may each and every one of us know the indescribable presence of God being born anew into our lives this Christmas season. Hear these blessings, these words from Paul. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ.